the American chestnut was a really important uh, tree species historically. Um, it existed in, in Eastern North America for about 10 million years. It had a range from uh, Southern Canada, South into Mississippi, um, East from the Piedmont, West to uh, the Ohio River Valley. So it had about a 200 million acre uh, range and it uh, was thought to occupy about three to four billion trees. Um, about one out of every four trees was thought to be an American chestnut and upland hardwood forest. It's extremely widespread tree species had a lot of cultural significance. So Native Americans would use chestnut, of course, for, for eating. Uh, the nut was high in protein content. Um, and, uh, and so Native Americans used it for that, but also they would, it was a very good uh, wood for kindling. So for starting fires, um, it has a, it really combusts uh, quite, quite well. So um, Native Americans would uh, cut the trees and keep them in kind of an orchard setting through coppicing um, to create firewood and also to create uh, more nut production. And then Europeans came in and kind of did the same thing. And in fact, um, Europeans really relied on chestnut, especially the Southern Appalachian communities for feeding their hogs um, and other domesticated wild, wild, uh, livestock. But also they would take the nuts, gather the nuts and take them to general stores and they would sell them and barter for flour and salt and things like that. So the chestnut, you know, had a lot of cultural significance. Uh, it was a good timber tree. It was rot resistant. It was primarily used for that reason. Um, it wasn't highly valued for structural timber, but it was pretty highly valued for rot resistance. And it was thought to occupy around 1,500 to 4,000 square feet of board feet, uh, sorry, board feet per acre um, on an average site. Um, and also for tannin for leather. So the tannic acid in the chestnut um, was used in the production of leather and it was thought to make up about two thirds of the, of the tannin production in the, in the Eastern United States. So it was extremely versatile, um, extremely widespread. It was thought to be a keystone species and it was here for 10 million years and it was virtually wiped out in less than 60 from the blight that came in. And that came in around probably the late 1890s but then was discovered in 1904 in New York and then kind of worked its way south. And so now it's uh, pretty much wiped out throughout its range. Um, but we're hoping to get it restored through our research and uh, partnerships with other uh, partners like the American Chestnut Foundation. Uh, hi, we're here in the Central, Central Appalachian uh, region. Um, in Virginia, uh, Giles County, Virginia, and we're in a, a stand that we planted American chestnuts in. Um, throughout the United States, there's a real problem with non-native pests and pathogens coming in and affecting native tree species. Um, so some of you guys may be familiar with the Western white pine that's been affected by the white pine blister rust. Um, and uh, it's a real problem because the trees that are here that are native, they don't have genes for resistance to these non-native pests and pathogens because they didn't evolve together. Um, so when you introduce something that's from another continent or country, bring it over here to the to North America, a lot of times our trees don't have that resistance in them and so they can be uh, very susceptible to those pests and pathogens. And the Western white pine is one example um, and the American chestnut is another example. There's emerald ash borer, um, beech bark disease. There's a lot of different uh, uh, trees, unfortunately, that are being affected because we keep bringing in goods um, and things from Asia, uh, primarily Asia. And Asia, because their forests are kind of similar to ours, they're temperate forests. Um, so when those species get over here, they can kind of live here easily. And then our trees are, um, are hurt by those species. Um, there are breeding programs in place uh, to develop resistance. In the case of the white, western white pine, there is a really successful breeding program going on uh, to get that species back into the woods and they're testing those trees in the woods. Um, and one of the really important things about that is when you have a breeding program for resistance, you really want to make sure that you're breeding for resistance to whatever you know, pest or pathogen you're trying to fight but you also have to make sure that when that tree gets planted out in the woods, that it'll grow and have those desirable characteristics that you want, not just for resistance, but for growth um, and maybe fruit production and things that you, that you desire. 
So in the case of the American chestnut, the resistance breeding has been done with Asian species like uh, Chinese chestnut and Japanese chestnut. And it took decades to figure this out, but they finally figured out that you basically have to take um, an American chestnut, which is the native tree and crossbreed it with a Japanese or Chinese chestnut. And then you take those progeny and then you back cross those to Americans repetitively. And each time you're selecting for resistance to the blight, which uh, is a fungus, but you're also selecting for those desirable traits like height growth, fruit production, phenology that uh, behaves like an American chestnut, etc. So after, you know, a hundred years of this work um, and a bunch of different partners, including the USDA, um, back in the old days, the USDA Office of Plant Pathology, the Connecticut Agriculture Experiment Station, and now the American Chestnut Foundation, we're to a point where we've got a tree that is uh, theoretically blight resistant and is 94% American chestnut in the genome and 6% Chinese chestnut. So we've taken those trees and planted them out here. And now we're gonna look at how they perform in the woods. And I just wanna talk real briefly about the, the fungus. And if you look right here on this tree, this is the blight fungus that we're trying to breed again, breed for resistance to Cryphonectria parasitica. Um, it is a fungus and basically what it does is it uh, gets into the tree on wounds. In this particular tree, black bears have come by and scratched this tree, but it can also happen on deer rub or cracks in the bark from natural age cracks, etc. And the fungus gets in there and lowers the pH of the tree to an acidic level. And then the tree, um, if it has no resistance, it really can't handle it and it uh, girdles the tree and cuts off nutrients, nutrient flow. And eventually the tree will die back completely. Um, sometimes they'll send up sprouts from the base. The fungus doesn't live in the soil. So sometimes the tree can live for decades. And we do occasionally have trees that get large enough to uh, flower uh, of Native Americans, but generally speaking, it kills the tree eventually. And so that's uh, what we're trying to get is a tree that's resistant to this blight but looks and behaves like an American chestnut, has good growth, uh, produces fruit that's uh, attractive to wildlife and humans as well. So one of the uh, useful and practical um, things about research like this is on our forest and specifically our district, the gypsy moth has impacted so many oak dominated stands and when we regenerate those stands sometimes we are not getting the stump sprouting to maintain oak and we have to rely on um, artificial regeneration of seedlings grown in nurseries uh, mainly oak but uh, also uh, with this research it'll tell us how we can possibly grow those seedlings in the nursery to be used in artificial regeneration for supplemental planting and enrichment planting. Um, so we laid out these plantings with an experimental design uh, so that we could empirically test the effects of uh, breeding generation so in other words, the B3F3s versus the Chinese chestnut versus the American chestnuts, and also empirically test the effect of seedling size class and empirically test the effects of civil cultural treatment. And so um, in 2011, we established six of these planting sites. We had three of these mid-story removal treatments, three of the shelter wood with reserve treatments. In total, it was around 1,100 trees that we planted that year. Um, and this site in particular, we planted about 250 to 300 trees on each of the mid-store removal and shelter wood with reserve sites. And everything has been replicated and we've used um, a randomized complete block design in order to help uh, control for the effects of the variation in the environment that you see, because uh, obviously on the uphill part of the slope is gonna be different than the downhill part of the slope. Um, so we've tried to take, take all of that into account in putting these studies in. And so we feel like the results that we get out of these studies are really sound and solid because they're replicated. And we used um, a statistical design that's been 
shown over time to be really effective in, in um, generating information about the effects of these treatments. I, uh, following up on uh, what Dr. Clark ha uh, has told you so far about the American chestnut uh, research. So um, when they were looking for a site to, to utilize for this project, uh, they, were, they were asking uh, districts if they had uh, available sites that met their criteria. Unfortunately, this particular uh, timber sale had just recently cut this unit. And I think it's somewhere between 15 and 8, 20 acres. Um, they had just finished the, uh, the harvest and it was on a site that was receptive and it had some natural um, American chestnut regen. So um, we were able to come in here and do the mechanical site prep and treat some of the stump spr sprouts to minimize the uh, undesirable competition. And uh, administratively, we were able to use a categorical exclusion that allowed for research to take place within um, this site. So uh, it, all those things lined up and I'm fortunate to provide the site for um, this research. So we started working with the American Chestnut um, putting in our first field plantings in 2009 and this planting here was put in in 2011 in total, we've planted about 4,500 trees across 15 different locations. Um, and our goal is to look at how these uh, traditionally bred trees are doing out here compared to the parental species of the American chestnut and Chinese chestnut. And so the trees that we're testing have been bred for blight resistance. Um, and we refer to them as B3F3s, or they're the third backcross, third generation trees. And this is one of them right here. And, uh, and so we're really looking at how this B3F3 tree is going to do out here in terms of blight resistance, but also growth and phenology compared to pure Americans and um, Chinese chestnuts. And we also have some other generations that we planted like B1F3s and B2F3s. Um, one of the other main aspects of this study is also looking at the effect of the, seed, the quality of the seedlings that we're planting. So we want to be able to tell managers um, what what kind of tree do you need to be planting out here in the woods? Um, is it better to plant a larger size seedling or can you get away with planting a smaller size seedling? Um, with oak, for example, you really have to concentrate on planting larger size trees, but because of chestnut, we don't know a whole lot about it because it's been gone for so many years. That was one of the things we wanted to test. And so we, we hypothesized that it would be similar to oak because chestnut and oak are related. They're in the same family, Fagaceae. Um, so that was one of the aspects of the study, planting large seedlings versus small seedlings. And that was just a very practical uh, distinction that we made in the nursery uh, that a, com that a com commercial nursery could easily implement with their nursery workers, grading out seedlings into small and large size classes. And what we found is that um, the B3 F3s um, on average are, are more blight resistant than the, than the American, um, but not as blight resistant as the Chinese. Um, and uh, overall, the Chinese chestnuts don't grow quite as well as the B3F3s or the American chestnuts. The American chestnuts tend to grow uh, best of all, and the B3F3s grow slightly uh, slower than the B3F3s. In terms of seedling size, um, the large size seedlings on average after eight years were five feet taller than the um, small size seedlings. So, in fact, you know, grading out those seedlings definitely has an effect um, and will save you time and money um, over the long term. Um, and one of the other things we're really interested in is we planted, this site was a shelter wood with reserve treatment where almost all of the overstory came off except for about 15 to 20 square feet of basal area came off. Um, and we compared this planting to a site that we're going to go to here in a minute that was a underplanting um, where we just took out the midstory. And the purpose of that was to see if we could get trees to grow and stay established in there over time. Uh, and in part, because if you plant out in the open, like we did here, your seedlings are exposed more um, to heat stress, frost, um, evapotranspiration, 
things like that. Um, so we wanted to see if planting over here, you know, if those stressors could be somewhat reduced by planting in the, in the under planting in the mid story removal site that we're going to go to in a minute. And so, um, but what we found was that planting out in the open like this, the trees did really well. Um, and the stress of the, the shock of, of taking them out of the nursery and planting them out in the field, the stress of having them out in the open and exposed to the heat and exposed to frost really wasn't that big a deal for these chestnut seedlings. Um, the Chinese chestnut, it tended to hurt them worse, uh, probably because they're not as adapted to these ecosystems as American chestnut. Um, and the problem is over in the mid-story site, those trees are just not growing very well. They're not getting enough sunlight and they're getting more uh, browsed by deer and things like that. So, um, so we're finding out a lot about American chestnut and um, what kind of civil cultural systems we need to be using and what recommendations we can make to managers. One of the uh, parts of our research was to look at this treatment, we call it the mid-story removal treatment, where we came in and removed the mid-story with herbicides, a hack and squirt treatment, in order to get a little more light to the understory, but not enough light that would encourage regeneration by really shade intolerant species. Um, and the goal was to get the chestnuts that we planted to grow a little bit and to become better established so that eventually we could come back in here and take the overstory off in a commercial timber harvest and they would be really competitive. And we have a few trees where that worked. I'm standing here next to one of the uh, B3 F3s that we planted. And this one is exactly what we wanted to see happen in here. Unfortunately, this is a rarity. Um, the majority of trees are below two feet in height. Um, they're averaging around a foot and a half tall on average in this treatment compared to the shelterwood with reserve treatment they're averaging around um, 12 feet in height and that's after eight growing seasons the other thing that's a problem in this mid-story treatment is the deer the deer herd density here um, on the eastern divide is pretty high and so when you plant a seedling that's not quite above browse line um, if you don't get that seedling to grow quickly and get it above browse line the deer is going to come in and repetitively browse your trees and that's exactly what happened in this treatment um, and of course the smaller size trees that we planted were hit worse than the larger size seedlings that we planted so what we're seeing is the mid-story removal um, it was not really successful uh, i would not recommend it for regenerating uh, american chestnut or oak for that matter we've seen the same thing with oak species um, it just seems like the trees aren't getting enough sunlight they're not meeting their photosynthetic requirements to grow. They're kind of hanging in there in survival. Um, so they're meeting their, their light compensation points, but they're not getting enough to grow and put on um, height growth. And so I wouldn't recommend that. Um, the shelterwood with reserve seemed to be a pretty efficient way to regenerate these species through planting. Um, and so we're just gonna keep following them over time and see how they do. And hopefully, um, you know, what we'll see is that the trees over in the shelterwood with the reserve will eventually become part of the next stand.